Welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the inner workings of the creative process. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. As I've mentioned a few times on the show, I'm a former teacher. This week, I'm bringing you a current teacher who's a former colleague of mine, Lisa Houston, who started the drama program at the Pennington School in New Jersey and now serves as its middle school dean of students. Among other things, Lisa tells us how she rebuilt the drama program from the ground up, how it's expanded over the years, what it's like to take a group of high school students overseas to perform at a major festival, and how she's seen theater impact the kids who participate in it and even change their lives. Teaching drama has clearly had a major impact on Lisa's life, too. Here's our conversation. So, Lisa Houston, drama teacher extraordinaire. I call myself a recovering drama teacher. (laughs) (laughs) So should I start over? (laughs) No, it's okay. I still teach some drama. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, for as long as I've known you, I do not know, like, how you got started doing the drama thing. and all of that good story stuff. So, um, growing up in Princeton, New Jersey, my parents, um, were both from West Virginia and they were both kind of from rural families in West Virginia. And, um, I think as they were growing up, their parents really encouraged them to be creative. So my mom was a great sewer, a quilter, always making her own clothes and she and her sister would make matching clothes. And then when we were little, she always made our clothes. Um, and my dad was an only child of a minister and his dad traveled a lot to different small churches throughout West Virginia. So he was alone a lot with his mom and he was very creative. So he had his own radio station in his room. That was like a cardboard box and microphones. And, you know, I think he made them out of stuff Mm -hmm. like they, nothing worked, but he would do little shows alone. And, um, and I think they, you know, they're both teachers and educators themselves. So the creativity and curiosity that they had throughout their lives, like went into them being teachers. Also, my mom was a preschool teacher for 40 years. And so a lot of our childhood was seeing her like prep Mm -hmm. projects or try this project or cut out 40 ducks or, you know, we would help her prep those things. And I was actually just telling my students the other day that when Suzanne, my sister and I were home sick together, my mom would teach us sewing. And so we had embroidery hoops and we would so little samplers. It was like, are we in the 1800s? No, <laughs> we're in the 1970s or 80s. But I think part of that upbringing like really was ingrained in Suzanne and I. My sister Suzanne's also a drama teacher. And then we also would do shows. So like one of our pastimes as we played was just a lot of make-believe pretend play. So mm-hmm. we had the backyard we had sort of set up, we would make like pie stands and stores. We played get smart with like the two neighbors next door. (laughs) Uh, We always were playing pretend games. And then inside, if we were stuck inside, we would do, we had a game called office where like Suzanne was the boss. I was the office assistant and we would use our beds as like big desks. And you, we had office supplies and like blotters on our beds and, um, fake phones and things like that. And we also would do Broadway shows. So we would put the record on for a Broadway show. Mm -hmm. Suzanne always played the lead. I was every other character. (laughs) And we had one of those, um, we had a gymnastics mat that folded in thirds, but we put it up like a dressing screen. And so I would like run behind and become like captain Von Trapp. And then I would be Liesel. And then I would be like the Nazi (laughs) soldier. And then Um, or if we did Annie, I would be like Miss Hannigan, Daddy Warbucks. Like I was every character and Suzanne would just play the leading character. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm guessing Suzanne is older. She's not, she's younger, but she's, she has a, I think she has a stronger personality in some ways. And she became an actress. Like she was a professional actress for a while before she was a teacher. So I was more behind the scenes kind Mm -hmm. of theater interest person. So That's sort of how we got started, I think. And our parents would take us to New York all the time and Philly and McCarter Theater. 
we just grew up seeing a lot of shows and visiting a lot of literary homes and locations. Like every trip we ever went on, they made sure to take us somewhere that Mm -hmm. related to something we read or something we were studying in school. And so we just had like a nice like kind of fabric to our childhood that promoted creative thinking. And I think that's why we were both drawn to the theater. So was there any kind of pushback when when you both decided that you wanted to do theater more professionally? No. I mean, they they love that. Like, they were fine with it. I mean, as long as we were living on our own, <laughs> we were successful in doing it. So I didn't really do a lot of professional theater. I mean, I've been paid to do theater, but I went pretty much straight from from college into an interior design job and then into teaching. And Suzanne had sort of a different path, but she had, you know, we, we learned how to do, how to support our love for the theater. So we had day jobs or other stuff happening. Um, and actually my son is studying theater and yeah, it's a huge financial commitment to send someone to college Mm -hmm. in 2020. And, but we felt like this is his passion. He loves it. He wants to be an actor. He's really good at acting. He has things to learn. He should be trained. And also he has some other skills. Like he has marketable skills. He has a work ethic. So he's not going to go hungry. He's going to wait mm-hmm. tables. He's going to build sets or work construction or do music, you know, or teach like he's great with kids. So I think, you know, as long as you know you can live, I think it's okay. Yeah. And I mean, I think teaching theater is still, you know, doing theater professionally, even if it's not in the sense that most people think of it. But, you know, I I majored in English, right? I have no idea if anybody would have reacted if I had said I wanted to major in theater instead. Functionally, in terms of like what I've done with my life, I don't think it would be that different. I mean, the jobs that I've had largely, like I started out doing tech support and tech writing. And that was a side job that I had in college because I figured if people were going to ask me questions in the computer lab all the time, I might as well get paid for it. It's, you know, I could have, I could have starved just as easily as an English major as I would have as a theater major, but I could still do that. So I don't know that it functionally would have made that much of a difference. Yeah. I, I mean, I was a double major, so I do have English also as a backup Mm -hmm. and my sister was theater and education major. Um, I'm trying to get my son to think about a minor, maybe in education, or at least have some classes that would back up Mm -hmm. um, theater just because I, you know, I think it is a really hard career to do without some other sort of thing that's happening too. But I think if you love it, you should pursue what you love. Like I always tell the kids at school, you do you, like if you love something, do it. Um, And that might sound harsh to adults or it might sound harsh to friends to be like, Oh, you're playing lacrosse. No, I want to do the play or, Oh, you're doing the play. No, I love lacrosse. Like I'm like, you do you, you know, follow what you want to do. It's kind of my little motto. (laughs) I think, I think there needs to be more of that motto. I think there are a lot of miserable (laughs) people who never heard that. And think exactly a lot. Yeah. It's interesting too, over the years of teaching to see how parents kind of swing back and forth with like letting kids really pursue what they want. And then, so like after the 2008, um, financial collapse, Mm -hmm. definitely families were like, you're going to college to study business. And kids would be like, what? I don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, or you're going to school to be an engineer. You know, there was just like a lot more pressure from families to do something practical. But Mm -hmm. the thing is like, you can't really live a life and progress as a person if you're not doing something that you actually like. Right. So it's, it's been interesting to watch it ebb and flow. Like, I feel like we were back in a place where parents were really like, yes, like, Oh my God. Yes. My daughter's an amazing singer. She should go pursue voice. And it'll be interesting to see like when the next kind of ebb happens. Yeah. That's so interesting. Cause I, I was not in a position when I was teaching to notice that, but you yeah. So been doing it longer now than I have. Right. And also I think being in, because I was teaching theater, right. 
my students, if I was really working with them to go to the next level, it was because they wanted to do theater, right? So you were in more of a broad position to just Mm -hmm. be helping kids be good writers and good thinkers and organized. Um, And so it's a little different, but yeah. yeah. And I didn't see the direct parental influence on those kids either because they were halfway around the world. True. So true. Yeah. I don't know. I'm hoping I'm hoping because we're recording this on March 29th. So we're still kind of at the beginning of the coronavirus adventure. But, you know, already I'm seeing so many creative things that people are figuring out how to do because they have to. Yeah. You know, the concerts and performances from somebody's living room online, because what else are you going to do that that may restructure things in an interesting way, too? Yeah, I think so, because I think people are realizing the value of the arts, the value of creative thinking, like even, even in my house right now, like we're trying to encourage the kids. Um, like Will plays a lot of music. Lucy is a painter. We're like, you've got to do that every day. You've got to be doing creative projects. Like I, I had bought fabric to make a quilt over winter break and I Mm -hmm. just didn't, I washed it. I ironed it. (laughs) I cut a few pieces of the quilt. But then yesterday I was like, darn it, I'm going to make this quilt. Like this is going to be my quarantine quilt. And, and I think we just have to pursue creative things. Otherwise we're, we're going to become mental. So. Yeah. And I think maybe we'll suddenly realize that those were the things that helped us from not becoming mental all along. And we just didn't notice it. as Yeah. And we just need to do them more. So I have, that's part of why I reached out to you to do this now. Cause I feel like I have this like (laughs) creative burst and like, I've have a renewed energy and like a renewed desire to like spend more time doing creative things. Mm -hmm. So when you got out of school, I hadn't realized that you had done interior design. You can't have done that for very long. No, I did it for just over a year. It was interesting. I There are aspects of it that I really liked. I mean, I met a ton of different types of people, some of whom I'm still in contact with today. And then I also loved like fabrics and I loved those like big books of like Mm -hmm. interior design wallpapers and fabrics and patterns and colors. But what I didn't like about it, and I had initially chosen to do that because I had been a set designer and I was kind of looking for a way to use those skills, but like be paid, Mm -hmm. (laughs) be paid every week. Yeah. So, um, I thought, Oh, interior design, it's a natural, but actually in interior design, most clients come to you with a very specific vision of what they want. It's very rare to find a client who is open to Mm -hmm. like, Oh, you show me, I don't know. Right. Like they might say that, but then when you start showing them things, you can see that their idea is Mm -hmm. very rigid or specific. And so that was really hard for me because I wanted to be more of like a creative, right. Like ally, but it was more of just like, nope, I want these red curtains in this kind of pattern, like come measure them and order them for me. So I did learn some practical skills. Like I know how to measure windows for curtains and a lot of things like that, which are great to when you're a homeowner or renting mm-hmm. a house or moving or whatever. But in general, it wasn't a creative field, at least the level I was just out of school. So I was in my early twenties. Like I'm sure more established people who have different types of clients, like that might be different, but for me, it wasn't, it, I didn't see it as like a life path, but it was an interesting kind of stop along the way. Yeah. It sounds like there wasn't really a whole lot of design in the design part. Not really. Somebody already knew what they wanted. (laughs) Nope. Yeah. So the practical thing. So then you just, you decided it was time to teach. I actually, I just saw in the, well, I was getting kind of tired of that job. I was working in Princeton on Palmer Square. And then I was like, oh. So I saw in the paper the job opening at Pennington. And at that time, it was just a part time drama teacher for middle school. And so I was like, I could probably do that. So I applied and I went to campus for an interview. And I think they had had sort of a parade of very unqualified people Mm -hmm. or people that didn't seem to understand what the job would entail. Because at that time, the school really had 
almost nothing in terms of theater. Like they had lights made out of tin cans. Like I think they had eight (laughs) tin can lights. Um, And they had had a very vibrant drama teacher in like the, I think like at least seventies, eighties into the nineties, maybe even back into the sixties. Um, and he was a librarian, football coach, drama teacher, uh-huh. and he had done a lot for drama at Pennington. But then once he retired, it was like a drop off. Like they didn't mm-hmm. replace him in the right way. Um, and so there was really not a lot going on. And so I had to just build everything from scratch, like literally <laughs> build a stage, but also build a program and build classes and build a clientele and build trust with my colleagues because people are always very suspicious of drama teachers. So it was fun. I, you know, I, it was, it, it was hard work at first, but I had a, a lot of great mentors and colleagues and, um, so it was fun, but it was a lot of work and I was young and I was single and I had the time and, you know, my friend Dolores and I, we were both single and artistic and we worked together and we would spend all these late nights and early mornings and weekends, just doing stuff for the shows and helping each other with our classes. And it was a very, very creative time. Um, lots of great memories from that time. And then as the program built up, I had lots more help. I had mm-hmm. like, a team of people who were doing things with me and like great kids and students. And so I wouldn't say it became less work. I think the shows became more ambitious and we also, I think something that we did well at Pennington and still Suzanne. So my sister took over my job recently as mm-hmm. I moved into a different job and what she still continues to do is a lot of audience engagement with the community. So we try to tie the shows to what's going on in the community or at school or in people's classes or some kind of theme for the year. So that's, I think a great kind of hallmark signature of the program at this point, but it is a really big endeavor. Like there's teams of people working on each show and, Mm -hmm. And we have three alums who have come back to teach at the school and all three of them do something with the theater program. So that's awesome too. Like one of them's involved in the fall and with the middle school play, one of them is choreographer. And then one of them helps in the spring with the seniors who write their own shows. And so that's just awesome to see like my former students come back and like give back to the program with what they've yeah. gone off to learn. And it's really cool. Man. That I, I had not realized that you like built that whole thing from nothing. That's an immense amount of work to throw on somebody and call it part time. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I was only part time for a year. So it was like it was very quickly established that, oh, wait, we like what she's doing. This is awesome. The kids love this. Like the community loves this. We need this. Um, so it really wasn't that much time before they had said like next year you'll definitely be full time. You can move on campus, blah, blah. blah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was good. Like they definitely have recognized the value of the arts. Like that is, is something that is good about Pennington still that it's a very vibrant community. And now in quarantine, we have a middle school cast and an upper school cast who are really trying to still pursue their shows. So at this point, we don't know, um, we're scheduled to go back to campus like mid April, but of course we don't know. Right. And so we're sort of, the kids want to move forward and they are, the seniors are moving forward and they have a class that they're still in doing distance learning. So they're getting coached and preparing. And then the middle school play, we're going to try to do a radio play version oh, cool. um, of David Lightfoot's Mud a Goose play. So a former colleague of ours. So we're going to, and David was like, yes, go, yes, do it. I don't care. Like, yes. Um, so yeah. that was a great, a great thing that we can do. Cause it's a 1920s play. And so that'll be fun. They, they meet Monday for the first time on zoom. So that will be <laughs> epic, but it's kind of cool that like even sixth and seventh graders, right. If they've had a taste of what the arts can do for them, like mm-hmm. in this time at home, they want to keep doing it. And that's really inspiring and cool. Yeah. 
And so, so since you bring that up, what kinds of things have you seen happen for kids who come in, especially if they haven't really done this kind of stuff before, right. when they are in sixth or seventh grade? Yeah. So what's interesting, what I learned pretty early on was that most elementary schools do not have drama at all. Mm -hmm. And even most middle schools don't have drama classes. So some of the independent feeder schools for where, where we get kids do have those programs, but it's very few and far between. It's like, oh, the class play in April or, you know, it's like a one shot deal. So that's a difference between like art and music are really woven into the fabric of elementary school mm -hmm. so that when art and music teachers get kids in their classes in sixth grade, they have some kind of like basic level of understanding. Whereas I was seeing kids come in, a lot of kids who had never done theater. So then I had to sort of build like, okay, what's the basic levels of understanding that we need to have to move forward? But I guess what I've mostly seen over the years is just that inner confidence, right? Mm -hmm. That a lot of kids, especially in middle school, your confidence is just shaken. Like your right. body is changing. Your parents are treating you differently. S students around you are socializing in different ways and moving at different paces and it can be very jarring. And so a lot of kids lose sight of their inner confidence. And so I feel like that's where I've really seen amazing things and also the connections that can be built from doing shows so connections with adults but also connections with peers like as i'm on social media so much these days making connections i can see like the former cast of shows will like comment on something all together and it's like they don't talk mm -hmm. but like they all have that shared common experience and so that's just cool to see and then like there's a couple that met actually in Artorama class at Pennington, they're getting married in September and um, I'm going to officiate their wedding, but it's just so cool wow. to see like, just like a simple <laughs> little connection, right? From the theater, like bloom into that kind of relationship, right? So that's like the ideal, but even just the cast members, right? Or, cast and crew members of the same show have such a strong emotional memory of mm -hmm. doing that show. And so that's like a, it's like a touchstone really for them in times of uncertainty or yeah, I, like it becomes a touchstone and it's just a very strong emotional connection. Even if you're not talking day by day or yeah. Yeah. Because as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking about like, you know, my college choir. And I'm sure if you got all of us in a room today, we right. would all start talking about, you know, do you yes. remember this thing that we probably didn't we talk took. about? Yeah. At the time, right. we probably right. didn't talk about it all that much. But in retrospect, it's like, yeah. Do you remember that guy at that rehearsal in New York? Yeah. And if anybody yeah. from my it's college incredible. choir is I mean, listening, they'll know who I mean. Yeah. Like I was in... <laughs> a very, very good choir at Princeton High School when I was in high school. And we traveled to France and every other year they took an international trip. So everyone in the choir was basically assured of going on the trip mm -hmm. at some point. Cause you were usually in the choir either from 10th through 12th grade or, or junior, senior year. And so everyone was assured of going abroad and it was just incredible. Like I went to France, my sister Suzanne went to Italy and my sister Caroline went to Russia. So it was just awesome. And, yeah. and the like memories from those trips are incredible. And I, I've taken kids abroad too. And I think, you know, to also see how the arts are appreciated in other places aside from America is really mm -hmm. important because America doesn't do a great job of appreciating no. the arts. Um, no. Selective people do and selective places do, but to go to London and see the National Theatre or to mm -hmm. go to France and see, like, uh, Comédie Française or, you know, some of those places, it just is epic to students to see that. Like, we, we sang in Notre Dame when we were mm -hmm. on our choir trip. Like, that's crazy. So those connections, too, I think are really important. Yeah, yeah and I think I think there is there is something about getting out of the country that gives you perspective. You can't get any other way. 
Right. And certainly when you're doing it through the arts, that's true. For yeah, exactly because then you're layering. You just said. Right? Yeah, you're layering yeah. on that like extra camaraderie or whatever. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, but it's also that perspective about, oh, hey, look, there's this thing here. We don't really have anything like that at home. Right. You know, right. I mean, you could see kids maybe coming back saying we should have a thing like that at home. Yes. yes. You know, and, and the right yeah. kinds of kids will always make stuff like that happen, too. Yeah. 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 So speaking of taking kids abroad. Yes. How many times did you take them to the Edinburgh Festival Fringe? <laughs> so I've been to um, I've done three trips to London and then two trips to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and the so t the first two trips I took to London were not performance based they mm -hmm. were just cultural like art and theater trips but they were amazing like we saw amazing things we went to the theater like 10 or 11 times you know in 12 days we went to all the museums we visited schools and then the last London trip we took in 2016, and then Pennington went back last spring break 2019 and did another similar trip. We did like a short 25-minute uh, Shakespeare mm -hmm. and then performed it at a sister school of ours in Kent. Um, so that was cool. Mm -hmm. And we did sort of, it was still like an, a cultural trip, but we had a performance element to it. And then the fringe trips were huge, like 36 kids, a full length production, like an 80 minute production. We had, um, we were traveling through a group called the American high school theater festival, which was, they're an incredible organization and they still run trips, but mm -hmm. we haven't gone since 2012. Um, and we would rehearse for almost a year. Like we would rehearse basically from October, November, and then we would travel the next August. So we would meet over the summer. We would, I mean, it was just it, the ties that those kids have. I mean, they're not kids, but <laughs> anymore. Not anymore. they're That's full so grown adults. <laughs> Some of them have children um, are like are incredible. Like they just, still have very deep ties to each other and very, very clear memories. Um, yeah. And it was, it was fantastic. And it was also amazing to go to another space that you will, you would not have seen before. I would have been the only person who saw it. Mm -hmm. So one nice bonus of this organization is they send the directors the previous summer, like, to scout. So they, you have a five day scouting trip with them where you get to see all the performance spaces and you meet with the tech team. And you also get to go to a ton of fringe shows and have really nice meals and go mm -hmm. out to pubs and stuff. Cause it's all adults, um, and really experience the Edinburgh fringe energy. And I highly recommend you any person out there who has not <laughs> been to Edinburgh, first of all, go to Edinburgh, but second of all, if you can go during the fringe, it's the most incredible thing. And so Nancy and I both share a love of Edinburgh for sure. <laughs> and I'm hoping in a few years, I have a big birthday coming up and I'm hoping to go back um, for my 50th birthday to the fringe, not with kids, <laughs> mm -hmm. but just to go back and see shows and yeah, but uh, we would we would have two hour slots in the theater. So we had a two hour tech for our show and the kids would have to be trained on everything in that two hour span. So we have um, actually one of my former students who was on one of the trips is is uh, works at the Metropolitan Opera as a technician now. And he says part of like what made him want to be a technician was that like two hour window where they had read the entire manual for the lighting board and the soundboard like ahead of time, but then they had to go in and just mm -hmm. figure it out and have to program the cues. Um, and we had to learn a counterweight system. We don't have that in our theater. And everyone had a specific job for the load in and the strike because when we were in the theater, we had two hours only. So you had like our show was 80 minutes long. I can't do math that well, but we had whatever, 15 minutes on one end and then our strike time on the mm -hmm. other end. 
And so we had to get our load in down to those 15 minutes so that we practiced at home, but it's, there's nothing like, you know, like traveling and doing theater is just incredible. Like I, I, I just think it teaches you so many life skills. We would have to line up along this wall and stand quietly. We had to be silently waiting for the previous show to end because at the fringe, basically from maybe 24 hours a day, Mm -hmm. but definitely from like 8 a.m. to 4 a.m., the performances are kind of in these two-hour slots. So you can travel all over the city and they make every possible space like the lobby of a hotel, Mm -hmm. the conference room of an office office building, the church sanctuary, the basement of the church, school cafeterias, like every space that can be a performance space becomes a performance space in Edinburgh. And so you could go see, I think there was one day when I was on one of the scouting trips that my friend and I saw maybe eight shows or something. We just went like from morning into the night bouncing venues so we would line up silently waiting for our time and then file into the theater and we had a timekeeper we had someone called the sweeper who was the last person so the, that person would kind of sweep us into the theater and then at the end of strike would like sweep us out of the theater um it was pretty cool wow yeah and i do really miss those trips but they were crazy amounts of work mm-hmm crazy amounts of money like we also had to do a lot of fundraising and and some of the schools that were going with us were public schools or from very rural places from low income places we were blessed that most of our families were full paying and we were just sort of fundraising some scholarships and then also just fun money for us to spend mm-hmm. on food on shows on our our materials for the show but some people were fundraising on top of the prep to yeah. fund the entire trip. Oof. So it's a lot of work. And so we, we've we moved away from that trip just because of the finances. And also, to be honest, just the anxiety level of society. Mm-hmm. Like I can't imagine doing that kind of trip now where kids were allowed to kind of roam around Edinburgh themselves in small group you know like we had a lot of safety precautions but the amount of safety precautions that are in place for the overseas trips now Mm -hmm. like i just can't even picture it working out yeah i mean the level of anxiety of parents and students is is much higher these days in general just a shame even though yeah it is a shame yeah i mean kids still travel and that's why that london trip is kind of a cool like mid-level trip where we're doing something small manageable you know it's like a half an hour Shakespeare um and you can do it in like a t-shirt and jeans right Mm -hmm. so we've we also like scaled back the production elements both of the Edinburgh trips we had like full costume some set pieces with us props um and so to do a Shakespeare kind of fits better that like traveling troupe kind of mentality yeah i was wondering like how much stuff you had to cart with you to do both of those edinburgh yeah the edinburgh shows luckily it was back when airlines let you take two big bags with you (laughs) so the first time we went every kid had a second bag because we were trying to be very democratic like Mm -hmm. everyone is going to take something and so we did it where like everyone had like three extra items with them And then the second time we went to the fringe, we were like, that was a stupid idea. Or maybe they were charging (laughs) us for suitcases, but we, we, uh, consolidated it down. So I think we had like maybe six or eight extra suitcases with all the props. And like, also we had to bring over printed materials because a lot of the atmosphere of the fringe is that you're busking your show. So you're on the Royal Mile, you're handing out postcards, you're putting up flyers, you're putting up posters. And every few days or after like a big rain, someone, fringe staff, I guess, go through the streets and kind of strip all the posters down. And and so you have to just keep replacing and keep talking to people and keep passing out postcards. So we would print those at home because it was much, much more economically sound to do that. 
And so we'd bring over all of those printed materials too. So that was like one suitcase was just postcards and flyers. Boy, that had to have been a heavy suitcase too. Yeah, but that's like the fun part of the fringe, (laughs) right? Is that you're standing out there, you're in part of your costume, you're meeting other performers, like you're going to see shows and then you meet people there and then they come and see your show. Amazing community. That is so awesome. Did you meet, yeah. you know, who did who did you meet over there? Because I, I, you have to have met interesting, really interesting people that you connected with. So we saw it's like two really notable shows to me. Well, first of all, I met some American directors who I'm still in very close touch with. Like one of them actually got married yesterday, got remarried. And like everyone was like, congrats, congrats. Um, and then... So I still like consult with those people or we go back and forth on Facebook. And then uh, probably the most famous person I met was W. Kamau Bell, who's a comedian um, and he has podcasts and, and he's on sometimes late night shows. And mm-hmm. um, so I had met him cause he actually knew someone I went to elementary school with. Like <laughs> he is in San Francisco and, lives near I, I, my friend from elementary school is a comedian. And so he was like, Oh, you should go see my friend's show. And then when I went to the show, I was like, wait, he's really famous. Like I've seen him on TV. <laughs> um, so I met him. He's probably my only like starstruck person that I met, but mm-hmm. there are two notable shows that I saw over there where we met the performers and the kids really actually three really bonded with the, with those people. So one of them was a production of the Scottish play, which I don't like saying the title. I'm so superstitious. Um, with, with teenagers and it was done in sort of the style of like a 1920s, thirties, like speakeasy. So the witches were like the performers at the speakeasy and they used a lot of like twenties and thirties music and like Frank Sinatra. Um, and all the costuming was like pinstripe suits and flappers. And it was just really, really well done. And then another production was of the 25th annual put oh spelling bee Putnam <laughs> yeah, County? i don't know the whole yes Putnam County spelling bee yeah. <laughs> um and they were college performers i think from england but they were super nice to our students and we were very inspired by their show it was just simple kind of cut down but like really really well done and then third we saw a show in 2007 that was done by a dance troupe um, from London. And I think they're called Zoo, Zoo something. And they did something called Into the Hood, which was (laughs) Red Riding Hood, but it was all dance. There was no speaking and it was incredible. Like it was just, it was like an urban fairy tale of Little Red Riding Hood all done through dance it was just super impressive and those performers were also so gracious to our kids that's fantastic i'm yeah totally intrigued by that particular play in the 20s now that you've made me super oh yeah it was it was awesome it was like incredibly well done and they were high school kids in edinburgh it was it was a school in Edinburgh that was doing it and they were so talented. And I was actually so sad because, um, when I went back, so that was in maybe 2011, I saw that show. And then in 2000, Oh no, no, it must've been 2007. And then when I went back, they, they weren't performing at the right time for me to see another one of their shows. Mm -hmm. Like I had missed their, their show was for two weeks of the four and I was there at the wrong time. So I never got to see their school do another show, but they were incredible. That's amazing. And it, it's reminding me of, you know, when you guys did that same play, but you gender swapped it. Yeah. Which I think was one of the early, you know, before gender swapping roles really kind of became a thing. Yeah. So I just love doing that. And also I went to Barnard college. So when I was in college, they did an all female Hamlet. Mm-hmm. So it was just something that was sort of in my mind as like a possibility to switch some roles. So yeah, I like doing that. I still, we still like doing that to this day. <laughs> yeah. I it think, was, ah, it doesn't matter. It's fascinating though. To Gender's see. a construct. Yeah. It's fine. 
<laughs> but, you know, it, it does change so much when you see, you know, the the ruthless warrior king is yes. suddenly played by a teenage girl. Yes, you know, it does change. Did you change Macduff, too? No, Macduff was a, was a male. Okay. Right, but then she had to fight Macduff. It was pretty epic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And my brother-in-law is a fight director, so I get to do, we get to do awesome fights at Pennington. <laughs> awesome <laughs> fake fights. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. And, the, you know, the other play that's coming to mind that, that really made an impression on me when I was there, because I don't know when I would have ever had an opportunity to see it. I don't know if it ever, if anybody ever put it on locally, otherwise around here, it was the Laramie Project. Yeah. Which was so, just mind blowing. That yeah. whole play. Well, I love the Tectonic Theater Company. Um, and they have a very vibrant online presence. So if you're, you know, if you're interested about the Laramie Project or some of their other work, they have a very strong like Instagram email presence, website. Um, and the Laramie Project was the first play that we did in our black box theater when our black box theater was new. So we were able to sort of use lighting differently and projection and the scrim. And I think it just combined into this great message and, uh, you know, christening the space kind of, mm -hmm. it was a really important show. And we've thought about revisiting it. Like I know Suzanne has thought about doing it, you know, she has chosen other projects, but it's always there as a possibility because the messaging is so strong and it's great character work. So it follows yeah. the story of, of Matthew Shepard, who is a gay college student out in Wyoming and his unfortunate murder and how everyone in Laramie reacted to that sort of piece of news. And so, yeah, it's a really, really powerful piece. It's a, and it's also a flexible piece. So, you never see the same version twice. You can see it, you know, at Princeton University. You could see it in New York. You could see it in Nebraska. You could see it in California. And it's never going to be the same because they've kind of purposely, purposefully left it open mm -hmm. for a little bit of interpretation. Obviously, they want you to follow the script and the stories because they're verbatim stories, um, which kind of brings me to my love of verbatim theater. Like I love theater that's made from people's actual words and stories. And we made a great connection in London. Well, not in London, but at the Kent Canterbury school in 2016 with a guy, Andrew, who were now like best friends. Ha! I like to say we're best friends. And he runs a, a group called Squint Theater in London, and they do a ton of verbatim theater and devised theater. And so he comes to the States a lot to interview people, and we get to catch back up with him, and he always comes through Pennington and, and does stuff with the kids. Um, so that's another cool connection from traveling abroad. I didn't even know that there was such a thing as verbatim theater, but that's... Yeah, so it is kind of a British term, like in... In the States, we don't always call it that. Sometimes it's called testimonial theater. So mm -hmm. Anna Devere Smith is a testimonial theater artist. Emily Mann at McCarter Theater. Her play, um, Greensboro, A Requiem, is verbatim. Uh, her, the Delaney Sisters play did is verbatim. Um, so there are some working artists in, in the States who do that type of theater, but I don't think it's as prominent as in England. And Canada. Canada also has a pretty strong presence. Wow. So yeah. there's more of this thing that I had never heard of before than I would have guessed. That's really cool. Yeah. yeah. That's really cool. What is it that you love about it so much? I just think it's fun. I, I love like fitting words into spaces or <laughs> putting spaces to words. Uh, so I love... Like, I love editing, you know, like I love editing essays. And that's what I think makes me like an okay English teacher is that I love <laughs> like getting into the nitty gritty with the kids and like mm -hmm. making words stronger and fitting them in. And, and so I think I like seeing words on a page and figuring out like, how would that look in space? And so I think that's what makes 
verbatim theater so cool is that you're taking a person's story and most of the time that story is shared not with the intention of like putting it back up on its feet right it's almost like you're taking a story that someone's trying to lay to rest or like release into the wind to get it off of their chest or off of their heart or out of their mind and space but then you're kind of grasping it and being like nope it's landing here like i'm gonna reimagine it and sort of give it legs again. And I think that's what draws me to it. So I always did with my um, my advanced level actors, we always did a testimonial theater project, which now we would call verbatim theater. But when I first started doing it, probably after, I think I did it before even we did the Laramie Project at Pennington. Um, we... Oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <sighs> we, uh, I, I would always have them do an interview and try to use the interview as a mm-hmm. performance piece. And it's, it's pretty interesting. And McCarter Theater in Princeton does, they have an outreach program where they will come to your school. So two years ago, our seniors for their project in the spring did something called the Pennington Project where they interviewed people and left them as anonymous voices and then sort of put together the interviews into a thread. And it was really cool. And so it's sort of teachers, neighbors. No, it was teachers, staff members at Pennington, students at Pennington, alums, parents. Um, I think they, they tried to have like at least one story from each kind of demographic of, Mm -hmm. of people. And then, they had a theme. So their theme was like overcoming adversity. And then last year's theme, I can't remember last year's theme, but last year incorporated some music. It was a smaller group. It was pretty cool. And so basically they learn how to interview. They learn what questions work, what questions don't work. Mm -hmm. They learn how to transcribe the text. They learn how to like isolate down what are sort of the important parts of the text and then sort of how to thread interwoven interviews together to make one cohesive piece yeah and then perform it the the interesting challenge would be turning that into something that all works as a single item yeah i mean like they start with a theme right so at least yeah that helps they're asking the same questions to everyone Mm -hmm. so then usually you can thread the answers together yeah so there have been a couple of kids from pennington who've gone on to do things on Broadway or on TV or... Yeah, there's a lot. There's a lot of working artists from Pennington um, and exciting stuff. So we had Michael Lee Brown, who was in Dear Evan Hansen, and he's about to release um, maybe a second album right now. He, I can see on his Instagram that he's like feeding out songs one by one during this COVID-19 time. Um, So he's like probably the most notable graduate, but then I have Coleman Betley on working at the Met and there's people on TV. Andy Ridings was on a show on Fox the last couple of weeks. Oh, really? And yeah. And there's people in New York directing and writing and acting. Um, James Fleming is at Yale studying directing. So that's really, he's, wow. he had gone to school out in Chicago and had really a great presence in Chicago after he graduated U Chicago and is now at Yale. And then another student, Andrew Agris is at Columbia studying dramaturgy. So there's a lot of theater artists. There's a lot of filmmakers, a lot of people working in television, um, Swan Gruen, who is from class of 2004, he works with The Collective in New York City, which is like a sketch comedy kind of group. And he's worked with, um, oh, what's her name? Amy Schumer okay. on her show. So he has like a very long sort of working actor career in small films. And, and he's a bartender, I think, or something. <laughs> um, but he... Yeah, and he's a real Pennington success story because he was a kid who was truly lost before he before I roped him in or probably the dean of students like made him do a show <laughs> just to keep him like in someone's eyeballs for after school hours mm-hmm. and it was transformative to his life. So 
Swan's a great example of what theater can do for a person. Yeah. And I'm also thinking, you know, you started out with literally nothing. And yeah. now you can name all of these kids who aren't kids anymore, who are right. off doing all this stuff, right? which is amazing. Yeah. Um, it is amazing. And we also are overrun with items now in our space. <laughs> so, so we're always trying to purge. And because when I first went to Pennington, there literally were those eight tin can lights and then one rack of clothes. And now we have two full dressing room spaces. We have a full tech shop. We have our own like mini barn out the back and we're full to the brim with items and things. And I think what makes it so hard for us is that we pick up an item and the adults there are like, oh my God, this is what so-and-so wore in Joseph mm-hmm. and the Amazing Time of Our Dream Coat. Or you open up um, you know, you open up a blazer and there's like a tag in it with someone's name. And then you're like, Oh my God, I remember when they wore this or, and so like kids will go help us purge and they'll be like, can we get rid of this? And I'm like, no, it's a sacred <laughs> object. Um, so it gets really hard because all these stories, yeah. right. The yeah. objects carry these stories. And so it's just super, super intense and meaningful. And that's why we're hoarders. <laughs> right. And the kids are keeping you in line from the sound. Right. Of it. But it is fun to like bring props or costumes kind of back to life, you know, to, to think like, oh, so and so wore this as a gangster in this show. But now the principal of the school in this show is going <laughs> to wear it, you know, and it, it's just kind of fun to see that. That's so cool. Yeah. So, so having started out from nothing and now having handed over the drama program to your sister. Mm-hmm. Like what what have you learned through all of this that you, I mean, because you can't have had any idea when you first walked in the door that you were going to do anything other than, you know, do a couple classes and put on a show here and there, I would think. Right. It's got to be a lot that surprised you and a lot that you've learned along the way that you never would have seen coming. Yeah. So probably the biggest surprises, I guess maybe challenges is a way to get to surprises. So I think challenges along the way were when people didn't trust or buy in. So that could be parents, that could be students themselves, that could be administrators at times. Um, Again, our school is very supportive of the arts, but there are things here and there Mm -hmm. where there's pushback always with the arts, especially with theater, because theater is very out there and in front of you. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and it's public and people come to it, right. It's different than maybe playing the piano in a practice room. No one's going to hear that. Um, so I think that public side of it was challenging sometimes and getting pushback, but I think that's where the surprises came through too. So, you know, mounting a show like we did the musical hair, a few years ago, which like no high school would do that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I did have to get permission to sort of remove some of the songs and, um, alter some things, but we did a pretty like hardcore production of hair. And it was very interesting because we did it in the winter of 2016. So before the election, right. So Mm -hmm. in, in the winter of 2016, we're all thinking everything's hunky dory in America. And we're like, inspired by Obama. We're looking forward to probably Hillary as our president. We have like this set of beliefs that we're working towards and the kids were doing hair and they got really into it, even though they didn't really have a lot to fight for. Right. Like Mm -hmm. we, the adults on working on the piece were like, we were always like, what are you fighting for? Like we would literally stop rehearsal sometimes and be like, what are you fighting for? What are you fighting for? And they would have to try to say like women's rights or, you know, whatever Mm -hmm. they could think of that was their passion at the time. Um, because they didn't have sort of a national crisis to react to. And then it was just really interesting how those kids from what they learned from doing the musical hair, when the election came to pass, how they went out and, and use those skills of protest of, of speaking your mind, of using real information to back up a point. 
um, of coming together with different types of people that don't share your viewpoint. I mean, that's important too. And so that was just really inspiring to see them take what was a theater piece, Mm -hmm. but then apply it as they became college students and voters and they're reacting to certain things. And some of them are still very active on their campuses. They're seniors this year. So they're facing not having graduations Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting to watch them now too, with COVID-19, how they are putting themselves out there. Um, how they work for political parties, how they, you know, support organizations. It's just really, really interesting and inspiring. Yeah, that's a side of theater that I think we don't think about very often. It's one thing to read a book about something. It's one thing to go see a show about something. But I think when you're actually up there on stage, being somebody else that it's really important to, you know, for a particular issue or a particular historical moment or whatever it is that that show is about, right. it gets into you in a way that it doesn't otherwise. Yeah. And like some of my favorite shows were those shows that seemed to like align with like a more epic happening. So we had um, an unfortunate suicide at our school and I was staging Hamlet at the time and it was, we were really coming up on production quickly, like as this death happened at our school. And, um, and so we, you know, had to have an emergency meeting. Like, are we still going to do the show? What are we tweaking about it? Obviously Hamlet is a, just about death. A lot of mm-hmm. people die Hamlet. And so it was just horrifying to think about like, how will everyone sit through this? Right. Um, but it was, it was incredible. Like the kids involved, they would come to the black box when they were upset and they would paint or they would staple fabric onto something or they would, you know, how can I help Miss Houston? I just need to be down here. I just need to be in the space. Um, the leads were trying to like juggle mourning the loss of a classmate, a friend, and also learning a ton of lines, Mm -hmm. (laughs) trying to be adults, you know, that were grappling with like life's greatest problems and questions, schoolwork, college applications. I mean, it was just like the end of October, like couldn't have been more jam packed with like strife. And then to watch the catharsis that came for the audience, like during the show was incredible. There was a great moment that my brother-in-law staged for me, um, the fight between Laertes and Hamlet, Mm -hmm. where we had um, Ophelia like in her grave on stage. And, and the grave was like this padded box that had been a bench, right? So the lid came off and they brought her in and laid her in. And then, the fight ensues between Laertes and Hamlet over her grave. And, and Doug had the actor playing Laertes like launch over the grave. So he like stepped up and like went move forward towards Hamlet. And like everyone in the audience was like, "Ah!" you know, but it was just catharsis. Like Mm -hmm. it was amazing catharsis. And um, we had done a punk couture version. That was what we, (laughs) Um, designed because I had, you know, my colleague Caroline, who's an amazing artist and she was in charge of costuming at the time. And actually Andre, who's an amazing artist came and worked with us on that production. Yeah. He's amazing. And so they, we went to the Met over the Metropolitan Museum of Art over the summer, Caroline and I, we'd seen a punk couture costume exhibit and we were like we're doing this we are so doing this (laughs) and so the whole like uh color scheme was like teal black and like hot pink and so uh hamlet's family was was teal and then claudius was pink and it was just insane and so that very last fight scene um where a lot of people die Mm -hmm. we had like this like pink wash of light just like fill the black box and everyone in the like everyone just felt sick like immediately you just felt like sickened right but then like as the lights faded back to sort of like a just a white wash of light like 
we could release those emotions from, mm-hmm. from losing someone at our school and everything that we felt about that. So that was incredible. And I think we've, we've done some other shows that have like eerily fit into what is happening at the time. And that's always my favorite. Like we did our town during hurricane Sandy. So perfect show when you lose tech week to hurricane Sandy and you're all in the dark, (laughs) you know that you can still do our town on the other end of it. Right. Mm -hmm. So that was a really special one too. Like there were just a lot of times where things cosmically aligned. Um, Some of my colleagues think that like, they were always like, Oh, Houston, you have, you have power over that. Like you're the one who like you brought this hurricane on yourself. I'm like, no, I didn't. It's so stressful. <laughs> but um, it's just funny how people are like, oh. And even we just did the show You're in Town as the musical. And so You're in Town is about like, it's about a water crisis. Um, but it's just interesting how eerily it's kind of aligning with what's going on right now with the virus spreading and people having to stay in and alter lifestyle choices so it's just kind of interesting how toilet paper shortages yeah how things align yeah and actually we we purposely left on the set um we had done a lot of clearing to clear it for the next show but there was there was a little area of the set where there's a a one roll of toilet paper that's (laughs) wired onto the set and my husband and i left it there as we went into campus the last time to get all of our teaching materials we like we just left that roll there. We're like, we'll leave this here in case we need it. <laughs> so, yeah, pretty funny. Oh, wow. This is so interesting just because, you know, I, I taught there for eight years, but a lot of this I was so not aware of at the time. So. Right. Like people are busy and and the process kind of goes unseen mm-hmm. because people come to the show, but they don't always come down to the black box or go into the lecture center to see like how things are progressing or the behind the scenes stuff. And I think one of the benefits or like one of the cool things about social media is that we've been able to share more of that over Mm -hmm. Instagram on the school's Instagram, the Facebook page um, so that people kind of get a more of a glimpse into like what's being done at the time when you're not sitting in your seat as a ticket holder. Right. Yeah. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, this has all been really cool. I feel like we could sit here and do this for another hour, but I know, but we are pretty much out of time, but thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for letting me spew out ideas about (laughs) my life and, share my story of playing every character in sound of music <laughs> i'm gonna get you together with my brother it turns out that's his favorite musical i had no oh idea. nice yeah no idea until the other always one. a good one always a good one yeah. yeah apparently he like saw it at christmas and you know went and ordered the piano book from amazon and it showed up two days later and my sister-in-law is like what is this and he's right. just been playing it ever since playing it oh Had that's awesome no yeah i mean clue. the sound of music is a great one and uh my daughter was in it when we were when we did it at pennington and she was seven and she was the worst cast member <laughs> She broke uh, like a $300 head worn microphone. She oh. went through like 12 pairs of tights. She didn't like her personal costume dresser backstage. She would yell at Bill Alford, who was the music director. Like when he was like, okay, we're going to run through this again. She'd be like, we are, we have to. <laughs> um, so it brings up fun memories in our house too, of Lucy's like <gasps> backlash against rehearsal process and whatnot. Wow. Um, but yeah, theater truly for our family is a family affair. We're all involved in it. And so it's hard to resist it, even though I've stepped away from it and passed on things to Suzanne. I just still have to dabble in it. And at times like this, when we're quarantined in our homes and, and disconnected, like theater is what I always turn back to. So I hope every listener of this podcast has something that they can turn to. Because I think creativity is important and essential to us to survive as humans. Yeah. 
you're not going to get an argument from me. I know I'm not saying it (laughs) because you and I always agree and share our projects and share things we're thinking about. So yeah, yeah, it's important. It's very important. So thanks so much for having me. Oh, you're so welcome. That's our episode. Thanks again to Lisa Houston and to you for joining me. Check out the show notes at fycuriosity.com and please do share this episode with a friend. Thanks. You can find show notes, the six creative beliefs that are screwing you up, and more at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.